In this century of American life, the hum of power-driven wheels is a sign of progress toward a higher standard of living. The age of mechanical power. The age in which we live. Welcome to TransLogic, brought to you by Chevrolet. I'm Bradley Hasemeyer. Today we're at the Henry Ford Museum, a temple to all things Americana. And what's more American than the automobile? So we're going to go inside, take a look, and find out if the technologies of yesteryear have an application for today. Let's check it out. It is an amazing fact that automobile engines supply more power than all the other power sources of the world combined. So we're here with Bob. He's the curator of transportation at the Henry Ford Museum. Bob, thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Awesome. Now, there's a whole bunch of cars here, and a lot of them are examples of alternative power sources. What are some of the ones you guys have here? We have some cars powered by steam engines, battery-powered electric. We have a solar-powered electric car, and we have a gas turbine engine car yes, right here. Very cool. Tell me about this turbine engine. This car was actually built by Chrysler Corporation in 1964. They'd right. experimented with turbines for a number of years. This thing will burn just about any liquid fuel. Yeah. It'll burn gasoline, kerosene, ethanol, methanol, perfume, bourbon. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to uh, burn bourbon, though, yeah. if it's good. The automotive industry takes another giant step forward as it unveils an experimental gas turbine test car. Here is a graphic demonstration of the low exhaust heat. In the end, they decided not to go with this. Why is that? The acceleration was slow. They're spinning at about 40,000 RPM. You don't change that speed very easily. Yeah. The other problem was fuel economy. Gas turbines run best. They're most efficient when they're running at constant speeds. Like in a jet engine. Like in a jet engine, okay. a turboprop airplane. The Navy uses them on ships. You don't do a lot of stop and go at sea. <laughs> That's true. This is probably as close as we've ever come to having a replacement for the internal combustion engine that we all know. Is there a chance that this could come back today? Uh, one thing you learn about the history of technology is never say never. This is the 1922 Model 90 Coupe built by Detroit Electric. They were the longest live builder of electric cars. They're clean, they're quiet, they're easy to drive, they're very tall, you can wear hats and things in them. They became a niche car, literally, for wealthy urban women. So as far as the specs on this, what would be the range for something like this? 100 miles on this car, but that's at about 25 miles an hour. That's in warm weather, not cold weather. That's on flat ground, not up and down hills. But even at 50 miles, what, almost 100 years ago, that's amazing. But remember, a 50-mile range is a 25-mile radius. That's assuming I go out and I come back. All right, so now we're in front of an 1896 Riker electric tricycle, the oldest electric that you guys have here, and arguably one of the first electrics ever. It's certainly one of the oldest surviving electric cars. It's got lead-acid batteries. <laughs> it's got a DC electric motor. It's a three-wheeler and the electric motor is actually in the back, so it's a one-wheel drive. You're sitting on top of the batteries. And the range on this would have been, what, 20, 30 miles? 20, 30 miles, maybe. OK. Yeah. So we see a lot of electrics today using the same idea of the technology, but advancing it with lithium-ion batteries. Is that a step forward for electric? Lithium-ion batteries are a significant step forward. Electric cars have been waiting for the great battery breakthrough since the beginning of the 20th century. The inherent problem, however, is a pound of gasoline will always contain more energy than a pound of battery. Today, steam in modern high-pressure engines adds horsepower to satisfy the needs of transportation. All right, so we're in front of possibly the oldest surviving American automobile. It's an 1865 Roper. Roper used this basically as a novelty. He took it to county fairs and circuses and drove around the track. It's amazing to us today, but people looked at this and they said, that's a really cool toy. There seems to have been a change in attitude between the 1860s and the 1890s, because in the 1890s, a whole bunch of people start building steam cars and electric cars and gasoline-powered cars. Other people say, that's really neat. Can you build one for me? All right, so we're in front of a 1924 Doble and it's arguably the best steam-powered car ever. How does steam power work as far as fueling a car and, and getting it going? A steam-powered car starts with a boiler. Under the hood of this car is not an engine. There's a boiler and a burner. And you inject fuel through the burner. That heats water, turns it into steam. The engine for this car is actually directly connected to the rear axle. 
The steam goes to the rear axle, moves the pistons, drives the car. This was an excellent automobile. It ran well. You could do 100 miles an hour. It also started quickly. From the time you turned the switch on this car till the time you, it was ready to go, it was about 90 seconds. Wow. And what had it been before, roughly? It had been, in some cases, 10 or in earlier cars, as much as 20 minutes 20 to get minutes. the car started. Wow. Yeah. So now we're in front of a 1910 Stanley Steamer. This was easily the most popular, best-selling steam engine car. It was a very good car. It was not excessively expensive. This car was $850. Which is 10% of the Doble. <laughs> not 10% less, 10%. Steamers are actually fairly easy to drive. They didn't require a transmission. Because of the nature of the steam engine and the way it was hooked up, they could drive as fast in reverse as they could going forward. This car was made by the Stanley brothers, uh, who were twins. There's something wonderful about the alliteration, Stanley Steamer. Stanley Steamer, yes. It was a car that was marketed very well. It ran very well. Not only the best seller, but it remains the best known name of all the steam cars. In this century of American life, the hum of power-driven wheels is a sign of progress toward a higher standard of living. The fact is, both the steamer and the electric were already receding into the background by then. And the big thing was range. Gasoline-powered car, I can simply go farther than I can either with the electric or with the steamer. Which is exactly what we're seeing now in 2010. Same thing. That question of range yeah. has been around for over 100 years. Huh. Gasoline-powered car just packs more energy in a smaller space in the form of that gasoline. Liquid gasoline contains the power all right, but unaided it can't release the force it holds. This is the Model T, the granddaddy of every car driving today from business production to actual look. This is, this is where it all really started. This is the most influential automobile, certainly in America, maybe in the world. Henry Ford was selling so many of these things that he really couldn't keep up. He kept looking for ways to improve his production process. Eventually, by 1913, that evolved into what we think of today as the assembly line, assembly line and right. mass production. Okay. And that spread not only to the rest of the automobile industry, but basically manufacturing in general, including McDonald's when they were selling more hamburgers <laughs> than they could make. At one point in the very early 1920s, half of the automobiles in the world were Model T Fords. It's really interesting now, you know, as we've been looking at alternative power sources, that we've seen the same problems from the 1900s as we're seeing today. The business model that developed for the automobile was this universal car. One car that can do everything. The difficulty with alternative sources is that the one car can't do everything. That business model, that notion of what a car can do is gonna have to change and the notion that one car will do it all is going to have to change as well. Very cool. All right, for TransLogic, I'm Bradley Hasmeyer. That's all the time we got. We'll see you again.